Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The this Offspring. Is Nathan this East. is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl Amy. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> I, this is uh, this is Mike Baker, and uh, I have nothing to promote. <laughs> and you're listening to the Break It Down show. <laughs> and you're listening to the Break It Down show. I, I guess that means I'm promoting the Break It Down show. <laughs> Perfect. And now the Break It Down show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Jim D. Felice, author of West Like Lightning. And you are listening to the Break It Down Show. We've got Jim on the show. We were going to actually grab Mike Baker, but we had a little bit of a schedule mix up. So we postponed that. And we're going to, uh, Jim and I are going to take the time that we have together because I don't, it, it seems like a fun thing to do. So we're going to kind of throw together an impromptu show. And we hope you guys enjoy it. Jim, what would you want to talk about today? Well, I want to talk about, you know, um, I heard one show not too long ago where you had uh, kind of turned the uh, tables and uh, so i wanted to to try my hand at that but do we have him on i think we do oh there we, we go we got him oh okay Super. great great What's up? Scratch all that. hey listen sorry about that i'm dealing with some delayed flights and late arrivals and you're, you're fine so i'm a little bit uh, up in there but i apologize for being a little bit late oh you're you're fine you're fine and believe me i i know how it goes <laughs> rescue this <laughs> so if mike just we'll do this fast so you can uh, focus on your flight stuff and if you've got to go just say the word and then we can uh, adjust but you've also got jim d felice best-selling author he just wrote west like lightning and he wrote uh, american sniper uh codenamed johnny walker which is a book that i'm also in um so he knows uh he knows a lot about the conflict world from all the stories he's told excellent well good to meet you uh good to meet you mike is there anything that you want to promote specifically that we should make sure we mention uh <laughs> Not really, no. You could talk about the New York Giants. That would be good. Um, oh, that oh, might God. help them out and give them a bit of a boost. But other than that, I can't think of anything. <laughs> that would be kind of depressing when we start talking about the Giants. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the definition of being a Giants fan. Well, that's true, too. Hey, man, this is awesome. We uh, we barely got it in. Actually, Jim and I had started the, well, let's go ahead and just do something anyhow, because you're traveling, and as we all know, heck, us spies, like we, we're we always ready to adapt to something. So uh, my, my, uh, my standard thing, and I think you can appreciate this, is, you know, the the car's broken down on the side of the road, but but no one's plotting to kill me. No one's got their finger on the trigger at this moment, <laughs> so it's all good. Cool. Okay, I, I wanted to. So first off, you've done a bunch of stuff on Joe Rogan. So if you guys want to hear more of Mike's things, you should probably go there and, and listen to the many hours of content. What I like to do, as you guys know, is uh, do the, these spy versus spy shows where guys who've actually done clandestine type work, in my case, tactical work, where it's less clandestine, we, where we exchange notes a little bit and kind of get into the grit uh, more of, of the things that you wouldn't hear when we're not getting so, I don't know, you, you know, Mike, you know, everybody like, kind of sensationalizes what we do which it is sensational, but the actual day-to-day -day stuff, I think, is often uh, uh, the really interesting factors because the, the wide view is really boring. You know? well, well, I was, you know, to prepare for this, I, you know, spent the last uh, week watching every James Bond movie that's uh, ever been done. So I feel like I really... <laughs> so you're right there. You're right uh, there. You got every, you know, it, 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 Frankly, I mean, that's all the, that's all the input you need. Well, uh, that and burn but, out, yeah. You know, I mean, I, th I thought between those two that uh, you know, I would I would have a really good handle. But you, you know what? What really, uh, really, we should do really is just give a kind of a brief, uh, you know, uh, you know, maybe a log line on on each of your careers because not everybody tuning in here, uh, you know, Peter, Mike, or, you know, is going to know anything about you guys. So maybe. Oh, I disagree. I think they're going to know everything about us. <laughs> um, but, yeah. but you're probably you're probably closer to the truth on that one. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Mike, go well, ahead and uh, give us the quick log line, and I'll I'll do one after that, and then we'll just keep on rolling. 
Sure. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. Uh, I, I spent it's been going on a couple of decades with the agency's uh, uh, directorate of operations and started out in, in uh, counterinsurgency operations years ago and and then moved into uh, counter narcotics operations during the drug wars, primarily and after and and then uh, into counterterrorism, where obviously everybody assumes the agency exists now. And um, it was uh, it was a great time. I, I, my whole time was spent overseas. I didn't I didn't have any any um, what they call headquarters tours. So I was I was very fortunate in that regard. And that's a tough thing to do nowadays because of the the way they try to rotate people in and out of the field. Um, and then uh, got out at a certain point for uh, not particularly um, you know. Um, jazzy reason but i i got out because my i was raising a daughter on my own and and um needed to be uh closer to home as it turns out they kids uh, at a young age they really don't care what you're doing as long as you're there to sit on the floor and play legos with them so um i got out and at the same time as a uh, very close friend of mine came out of the british teams out of sbs and and uh we uh started a company called, called uh, diligence uh, which i guess Look at me, I'm promoting my company. Uh, and that's a, a global intelligence and security firm, and we've been building that ever since. And So we, uh, <clears throat> we've got offices spread around in a lot of different locations, Moscow and Geneva and London and New York and Washington and Mexico and I forget where else, Sao Paulo and, uh, and other places. So a good bunch of people. We've been very fortunate. We hired a lot of great folks. It's uh, mostly a collection of intelligence. We have a large security services group. It provides a variety of things, and and, uh, and that's pretty much it. I live in live in Idaho and, and hang out there with my uh, extremely wonderful wife and three little boys now, and my daughter's all grown up and living working in China. So yeah, that's me in a nutshell. A big nutshell. <laughs> big nutshell. Yeah, and then I've got a thousand combat tours with a variety of different units and and U.S. Uh, agencies and elements. I was better at being maybe Mike. You'll recognize this as, as being valuable. I was better at being with than in the uh, the government. <laughs> <laughs> I was a army counterintelligence agent, and my uh, my superpower is I tell the truth and I can see what's going on on the ground. And my greatest demise is that uh, I tell the truth at what I see on the ground. And a lot of what I did didn't necessarily focus on threat because if you show up everywhere and say where are the bombs people tend to not really talk to you honestly but if you go in and you say tell me what's going on around here and you get to know people and you're respected uh the information you cannot turn it off it flows in like a crazy river and uh and then you give the command new things to worry about and especially in a counterinsurgency uh, it's really easy and this is from the ground point of view it's really easy for the u.s forces to become the actual insurgents as we try to jam jam help down people's throats we uh we undermine the like the, the thing is is, is from from what I've seen on the ground with military units, the hearts and minds thing is oriented in the wrong direction. The Americans don't need the hearts and minds. It's that governor who's going to be there six months after you leave, who's trying to gather people that he can help govern and solve problems for. And that's sort of where a lot of my my success came in from was giving commanders the actual intel that where and where they needed to apply their efforts. So that's the bulk of what I did. I had a moment where the clandestine service and I were kind of dating and seeing if we were going to go out. But like you, I had a young daughter who's now old and barely ever needs to see me and and but but i said no I, I can't i can't do the full clandestine service thing with the cia because i would be gone too much to, and i know that that's what i have to do so i did not uh, elect to do that either so i can appreciate that yeah it's it's uh, it's important to every now and then you got to step back and and think about priorities and, and it's it's tough it's a tough decision but it, it uh, it's the right one is from what from you know what you guys are talking about there then it almost sounds like you're saying that uh, you know the profession is a kind of a younger man's or, or woman's uh job um is that, or maybe an older person's once your kids are raised uh, is that uh, is that where you're going with that uh well it depends on what you're doing right i mean there's a lot of different uh jobs responsibilities within at least i you know from from my perspective with with the agency but if you're in something that requires a lot of travel and and, and you know time away then yeah I mean, I mean i think you you know it, it just by definition it's it's more suited to people who don't spend time you know while they're gone thinking about you know little kids and feeling guilty about being away but 
you know, people manage to make it work. It's, you know, it's just, it's just, it can be a difficult, um, it can be a difficult task to balance those. And that's no different than anybody else at any other job, frankly, that's trying to balance work and life and everything. So I don't want to make it sound like it's, you know, over the top, but there you go. So I didn't answer your question. <laughs> and look at me. <laughs> let, let me, let me very ask good, you this. Very th- good work there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Turning Thank you. it around. Okay, I'm known for, I'm known for talking a lot and not saying anything. <laughs> so let me ask you this then, Mike, I, I, I know that, from folks to actually go on the ground and actually do stuff, you know, those of us that are out there putting our necks on the line, there are everybody in theory wants to do that job. But the people that actually are able to do it usually are not like you have the people that are good at analysis and it, it, it sucks for them, but they have to stay in the office and put the puzzle pieces together because I shouldn't be doing that when I'm on the ground. And then you have the people that are have a real knack for operating and doing the operations. They're probably not as strong as the people people, but you know, they can operate on the ground a little bit, but when they're better served because they understand what the people people have to do, is that the same kind of thing you, experience where like you show up with the guy and you're like you have top siders and a blazer on and this is uh, a disco party we're going to what are your thoughts on that <laughs> well, well first of all I, I i don't think anybody should really be wearing top siders unless they're they're <laughs> maybe sailing um but other than that uh i know i think it's horses for courses right so it's it's everybody finds kind of their their swim lane to that's going to suit their skills their strengths hopefully right best and I mean, some of the most important people we've got at the at the uh, at the agency are the um, the analysts and the reports writers and the reports officers, um, and you know the folks who keep the trains running on time and and importantly have a bigger picture. If you're sitting out in some you know fifth world crap hole and you're you're working on a specific operation, you know from down on the street you don't have the ability to see all the all the parts and pieces that make up that particular concern or that task or that priority, and you know, so you just get on with it. You do your part of it. And back in, in headquarters, you got people that are putting together the pieces of information from a variety of different operations and sources, and they're seeing the big picture. So um, that's a, that's an enormously important thing. And sometimes you, know, you find a little bit too much of the uh, us versus them, the, the field versus the headquarters mentality. And I, I never quite could figure that out because, you know, theoretically, we're all on the same team. But, you, you know, Mike, you were, you were talking about, well, I never had to do, you know, a headquarters tour or, or that. I mean, it, was that uh, was that a conscious decision that you didn't want to get involved in maybe, uh, you know, palace politics? Uh, no, you know, I was just, I, I, you know, I, I signed up for a specific reason because I like the operational side of things. And and, uh-huh. um, and I was fortunate because of that time, right? You could do that. I knew guys that, that spent their entire careers overseas, 30 years, 30 years, you know, some more. Um, nowadays, you know, in an effort to try to uh, correct sort of that or, or minimize that us versus them or headquarters versus field mentality, they do tend to rotate much quicker. So you do a tour overseas, you come back to headquarters, you do it. And that's a good thing, I would argue, although, again, I think they should kind of, you know, be a little bit more adapting to, you know, folks that just really don't want to prowl the corridors of headquarters. And, you know, some folks understand better than others that look if i want to rise up to a position if i want to be a division chief or i want to you know get to a certain you know level um then i do have to spend time in headquarters that's just the way the game is played and that's no different than the military or any other you know uh, organization or, or corporation but you know from my perspective i just i enjoyed being out i thought that was the point of the exercise and you know i never envisioned myself as, as rising to a to a particular, but nobody, I don't think anybody else envisioned me rising to a particular level. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we were in complete agreement on that one. Yeah. So the thing about like being out in the field is you also can't, it's hard to, at least it was for me to transition from that field mentality where I'm sort of making my own syllabus, my own plan every day. And yeah, I've got some input from higher, but they really don't have a, a grasp on what I'm trying to do. I need to be out. I need to be exposed. I need to be interacting with people. But then every now and then I have to unplug from the field and granted in my case the field and headquarters are literally a a 10 minute helicopter ride apart but they're a world apart like if i would say like they're in the spaceship right and and i'm on the ground and but sometimes you have to come back so they can go hey pete uh we were wondering you know what's the most common tv channel uh, in this area and i'm like tv they don't even have electricity 
and then that completely reshapes their world in a way so that they they because they always want to overplay their hand. Was that an honest? Was is that an honest example? I mean, did that really happen to you? Uh, I, let me say this. One, I have met a CIA. I, I totally believe it. But no, it, it's 100% true. And I've also met a CIA clandestine dude who was wearing topsiders in the field and a blazer. So, Yeah, but this yeah. was in Bermuda, right? Or, uh... no, it was in Bosnia. It was a long time he ago. Was wearing, he was wearing shorts and high socks as well. So, yeah, it's all part of it. As long as you accessorize that blazer properly, I guess you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it no, a, it's a real example uh, when you come back and and they, you know, they're trying hard. And that question was a bit of a a, a hand grenade thrown in my lap, you know, because how the heck am I supposed to know that? But um, it was like a bit of a, a check on the quality of my work, and I was able to lob it right back at him and say, "There's no electricity in this valley." So, for sure, if you're in the field all the time, there's things that you see contextually that you cannot get into a report in a way that anybody above you will understand it. Well, no, that's that's absolutely true, and and you know we've we've got the same you know issue and, and same concern, which is why they they tend to try to rotate uh, analysts and and others, reports officers and others out into the field because you know, and they all agree, they all know that that you know if if you spend too much time uh, in headquarters, no matter how clever you are and how much inside knowledge you've got about a particular issue, you've still got to be out there and you've got to be experiencing it. And that just helps your your work when you're back in headquarters, I think. I think they would all agree on that. Yeah, for sure. And, and then there's other things, too, like where the questions they want to ask are usually not as good as the questions you might recommend as the person who's actually engaged with the people down there. You know, uh, we – we lose that perspective in the, to really hit the sweet spot for where the help needs to be or where the uh, information needs to come from. And then the quality of information, boy, that's always a problem too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how yeah, well, it's, you know, and, uh, you know, again, I, I think I don't want to make too, uh, too much of the sort of the, 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 the effort to try to balance the us versus them or the field and headquarters thing. It's, but it is it's there you know sometimes it's it's uh, a little bit more exasperated than it, than it should be uh but you know i think in general people are aware of it and they, they keep trying to balance it out but if, if you're in the operation side of things and you know from my perspective unless you're just blatantly trying to climb up the uh the ladder you know your your interests are overseas you know that's all you want to do you know the the issue kind of behind what you guys were just talking about is you know how much micromanaging are you getting from from above i mean you know, Pete, that you know getting a question like that could be totally innocent that some idiot is trying to you know figure out where to do an ad buy on uh, you know radio baghdad or whatever but um but then you threw in the, you know, they were trying to, you know, it was kind of a test of me and stuff. H- how much micromanaging do you get when you're, you know, when you're in the field or, or you know, you're in action or, you know, or just doing your thing? Well, I mean, I think from 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 our, I can only speak for for the outfit, but I mean, from from the agency's perspective, if you're when you're in operations, one of the great things about it is they give you a tremendous amount of responsibility at an early age, which I I, I just thought was. Uh, Really, that that was part of the overall appeal was they, as long as you understand what the mission is and and you demonstrate an ability to to do the job, uh, you're given a great deal of responsibility. And now and then it then it breaks down as it always does in every organization based on individuals. So I worked for some some folks who, you know, were from my perspective were you know really had. Uh, had it spot on you know they just they again they tell you what the mission was they would have already assessed that you knew what you were doing theoretically and they just back off and let you get on with it and then you know th- then occasionally you'll run into the person who just can't help themselves and they feel like they do need to micromanage but that's a that's a personal management style that impacts every organization but i think in general terms with the agency yeah they from an operations perspective uh, you know starting out even as a, as a as a young officer they they give you a lot of room what about with the improvements in technology now? And maybe that's more a question for Pete. I mean, it's at least theoretically possible for, for me to follow every step you're making out in the field. Yeah, you know, I would say 
to talk about the micromanagement part, the Army is a little different organizationally where there's a lot of bosses above you. There's an operationals boss. There's an intel boss. There's a commander boss. The commander has several layers of bosses. Uh, there's people that are attached to you that have bosses that want to boss you. So if you don't command their respect and do what needs to be done, if you don't have that ability developed, which is a definitely a, a senior level ability to do like you have to graduate up to that level to one be given that and then also to be able to take that responsibility they will absolutely tell you what to do and and really constrict like the the stack of regulations and guides for what we do in counterintelligence is probably three and a half feet high and you've got to have a command of that stuff so that you can defend yourself more, more than keep yourself out of jail because the, the basic rule is don't do something that's obviously illegal and you're pretty much not going to go to jail you know, don't uh, don't don't disclose top secret to people, right? <laughs> and you're not going to don't keep money for yourself. That's supposed to be used to gather information, then you'll be all right. But everybody else is afraid of that, and and since they are afraid of it, they want to control you in the field. But if you are like, look, this is why I'm doing this, and you can account for it, you're fine there. And then the technology thing is a really good question because during Mike's and my time, it went from being you have to write something pen and paper. To like, I literally have couriered a floppy disk of my reports up to my headquarters to now you just like just in an instant flash things over and it's all secured. It's like wildly different in terms of getting the information up, which doesn't in any way improve our ability as an organization to answer questions. It just means there's more information to push through. Yeah, the technology has definitely changed things. There's no doubt about it. But, I mean, you know, in part for the better, in part maybe, uh, you know, it's caused its own set of issues. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, try to find try to find anybody that can know how to use a, a map and compass anymore, uh, <laughs> you know, if the GPS goes down. But, and, I mean, we, you know, I remember being in some, you know, uh, fifth world, uh, I forget what term the president used for describing countries like that. But, anyway, uh being in a place and, and, you know, having to create a uh, sort of a standalone dark room and use whatever was locally available that we were able to somehow access to create a dark room so we could develop some uh, surveillance photos. Mm. And, you know, now it's, it's an entirely different world, <laughs> but yeah. uh, I, I think we've lost a little something. Perhaps we've lost attention to detail to some degree. And by that, I mean, you know, the, the technology makes things, easy and when things are easy you sometimes maybe uh get a little bit sloppy or you rush things a little bit and without that technology you're you're kind of forced to slow down just a little bit and maybe that causes you to notice things that you otherwise wouldn't have noticed it's going to keep everything from going sideways is that a matter of experience or training what's where does that come from well, I mean, I think it's uh, again. I think the technology kind of drives most of it, right? I mean, if if, if you've got the ability to, um, you know, use GPS and uh, you can take f pictures using your phone and um, you know upload them, then you know you, 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 there's no need for you theoretically to learn how to you know uh, develop uh, film the old fashioned way. You know, spooling it up in a in a bag and hoping that the chemicals work. And I mean, I remember you know, pulling out photos, looking at them, and then realizing that we just blown an entire surveillance out because the photos weren't developed properly. And, you know, that's a bad day. But, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't think it's an individual thing. I think it's the technology creates these opportunities, and I think then that changes the training and the, and the, uh, and the way things are done. And I think that's what I mean by sometimes I, 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 there's advantages, no doubt about it. I'm not some sort of, you know, freaking Luddite, but I think that there is a, you know, a, a there's a downside too that we sometimes forget. I want to also point you're totally right about the picture thing and then all, all the other ways to gather things, but also just the ability to slow down and focus on the person that you're interacting with and, and getting done the things that have to get done in that meeting. It, it's real easy again, like to think, ah, oh, it's sexy, but I've got a job to do and I've got to have about four different conversation streams ready to go in my head at any time, maybe 10 different conversational streams that I want to play with. But also I've got to, I've got to, 
discern who this person is. I need to be able to say, like, this guy wears brown socks on Wednesday because his wife loves brown socks and does laundry on Tuesday, you know, or whatever. I need to know this person so that I can I can accurately depict them to the hire as as we try to decide what to do. And and I find that that's a that's a discerning point for people that are good in the field versus people that are not their first meeting accomplishments are often done two, three, four, five, six meetings later. And, and there's in my world, tactically, there's no time for that. You've got to work faster than that. You've got to have a command of what you need to know to be able to put together an accurate dossier for this person. Does that resonate with you at all, Mike, with your guys' pace? Well, yeah. I mean, I think, I think the advantage sometimes with, with the, uh, the agency, if you're in sort of traditional uh, development and recruitment, um, line of work you know you you tend to have more time right and that's important because you know you're ultimately i mean let's face it if you're if you're if you're in that particular uh line uh with the outfit and the operation side then your ultimate goal is to recruit an asset well you're basically asking them to uh betray their organization their country uh their family their friends that's a heavy damn lift right so you know taking your time and making sure you have it right. And that by the time you eventually actually, you know, bang up on that person and pitch them that they already are expecting it, and you know what they're going to say. That's not something you can do overnight. So the difference is, I mean, a, a good example would be law enforcement, the way that they recruit sources. That's mm. a much more, and also, you know, use and hold on to sources. That's a different world, right? You can't compare the two. And so, you know, the agency, if you've got the time, that's great. Some, oh, you know, a lot of times you don't because of access issues or uh, the time frame or the fuse on the uh, on the actual issue that you're dealing with. But, you know, ideally, you've got sufficient time to to to, to work them over and, and again, to develop all the, the rapport and the relationship that you need. But, you know, you, you again have to be. You know, you're absolutely right in terms of attention to detail. Yeah. Um, I've never actually worried whether anybody's wearing brown socks or not. That's a new one on me. <laughs> but I'm going to start paying attention to that sort of thing. Yeah. And if they're wearing brown socks with topsiders, then I didn't think that was possible. <laughs> it was. It well, is. It is. But that may be part of a signal to you, though. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That brings yeah, up a great point. It. So I know in movies you have to do this, and I know you've done some advising on this kind of stuff, Mike, but like the whole bona fides process or bona fides, depending on how you want to say it, it's not – it's not like the hawk flies on Tuesday or the you know the, the black man wears brown shoes or whatever. It's none of that stuff. It's like a really – the whole idea is you're not supposed to know. No one else is – but that doesn't work in a movie. But it always cracks me up when they have these ridiculous – I think uh, Brad Pitt said to Robert Redford, I need to get to the tall corn. And <laughs> it's just such a ridiculous yeah, yeah. bona fides. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's an interesting world, uh, the world of TV and, and film in that genre, right? I mean, but that's fine. They got to tart it up. And I've always been amazed when, you know, when people, you know, kind of mixed up the two and, and mistook what they were seeing on the film for necessarily for for real life. But um, look, it's you know, it, it is you know, it is what it is. It's it's um, there are times when it does. You know, you walk away from something, and you think, yeah, this is like a movie. This is unique. This is amazing. And there were those moments, and those could, those would keep you going for a long time, where you'd walk away and you think, nobody else right now on this planet is doing this. Mm. Right? This is a completely unique thing that I just I just did. And you know, hopefully, it doesn't get completely screwed up and <laughs> and we got a lot of blowback. But but you know, but I mean, that's and that that's a, that's a magical moment. But there's also a lot of downtime. Look, if they did an actual movie uh, or a TV show about what it's actually like, people oh. would be you know people would be amazed, right? Because and they'd also be bored to tears because you'd spend you know uh, six episodes watching some idiot sit in a safe house waiting for something to kick off. <laughs> And then you'd have probably two or three episodes where he has to explain why he lost some gear or some money and have to come up with some receipts for it. Um, and, you know, he got a couple episodes where he's trying to write down and remember everything that just happened. So, it's, it's a, it, you know, it's, it's not like the real world, but there are those moments and those moments are what keep you going. How many of those moments uh, did you have in your career? Just just roughly, did they happen every six months, every six days? What the... no, I was I was lucky again because I was overseas a lot I, the whole time, basically, and and I, it was a good time to be in. And and we had we had I had I was fortunate to have terrific management. Um, and you can go through 
I, I would argue you go through a career with the agency and not have a lot of those moments because you happen to hit a cycle where it's very risk averse as an organization. Right. You know, and it goes up and down depending on you know how often they've gotten their ass kicked on Capitol Hill. But uh, <laughs> it's, you know, so it, you, you can, but I got lucky. I was in one of those, you know, cycles where we were doing a lot and there was a lot of willingness to evaluate, not take stupid risks. You know, you still have to do that calculation, but, so yeah, I was I, I I had a great time. I'm not one of those people who who left and for whatever reason felt like they didn't get enough hugs or right. you know they didn't you know <laughs> they weren't listened to and if they just listened to me then we wouldn't have had whatever 9/11. I you know I had a great time. I met wonderful people. I've got a tremendous amount of respect for the folks there and for what they do. And you know so I'm you know people probably hear that and think uh, okay so the guy's completely subjective but you know so be it. I wanted to bring as, it as back. Lindsey Graham says, "I don't give a shit." <laughs> I don't uh, give a shit. <laughs> I wanted to bring it backwards a little bit to source recruiting too, because it again on TV that stuff's so easy to do. Like you really don't know. Like you want to get to the point where you know at least in my in the pace that we work at, you're going to pitch somebody something, but the area is so non permissive, you can't guarantee anybody's safety. So I've literally had it where the person we were going to pitch ended up with no head a couple of days before we could even pitch them. We've had had it where the person we were going to pitch the events that we were so gonna... they said no then <laughs> yes well that might be i put that one down as a maybe because you're not getting <laughs> yeah right. that's right so you're saying it's possible yeah <laughs> we had a guy that we were all lined up on this whole initiative that we were going to do and i'm positive he would have said yes but overcome by events obe the event changed and every the focus changed and so this person that we had dialed up that was going to be you know an operation it never happened. So, that, so like in terms of like the good days, bad days. There's a lot of bad days where you're like that. None of that went the way that. Like it's not a matter of like if it's going to get yeah. screwed up. It's like how screwed up will it be, and what do we do with what screwed up? You know, it's it's. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, to be fair, the guy with no head had a bad day too. Um, <laughs> well, but yeah, yeah we, point, but, but, but point taken. Yeah, we yeah. also terminated a dude by take, giving him a ride in an army vehicle back to town and give him the kiss on both cheeks because we determined that he was playing now hopefully we were right but you know you're always my, I'm always asking this question who's running who and you've got to be run a little bit if you want to be able to run somebody else like you've got to be willing to not, not give up secrets or anything but they need to really think that they've got a handle on you if you're actually encountering someone else who's an active collecting operator yeah I mean I would I would I would put it a little bit differently they need to they need to, I mean, with the exception, there's always some, right? There's always yeah. some who do it for a very particular reason. Uh, but, you know, a lot of them just, they, they need to actually be able to convince themselves, right? Yeah. That there's a friendship there, that there's a relationship there, that there's something there beyond the, the bald fact that they're just, you know, about to betray everything. Right. So they have to, you know, you have to be able to give them that cover, Right. And, and it said, if that's what, what it takes to make that work, then great. You've got to be their pal. And, and that sounds very mercenary because, you know, you're not. And, uh, you know, you never you never uh, fall in love you know, with your uh, assets. But you have to understand the psychology of it so that they can convince themselves so that then they can get over the line and, you know, start providing uh, the uh, insight, and the intel that, that you need. And it's a very, it's a very mercenary world. And I've, you know, I've had people. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one. Consult others to build their own and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So, if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner. Or at John LG69. At the Break It Down show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. And it's a very, it's a very mercenary world. And I've, you know, I've had people talk to me about it and tell me what an asshole I, I am, you know, because you can <laughs> do that sort of thing and process that sort of thing. And I'm thinking, well, fine. I, you know, I do what I do. You do what you do. You know, I don't judge the fact that you're a douchebag, but, you know, I think it's, that's just the way it is. I, I, you know, and, and they better be glad that there are people out there that are willing to do that sort of thing because, you know, the hostiles are out there trying to screw us over every day. What's the general, mo I mean, what's the biggest motivation, you know, when you get someone to, you know, turn, 
to cooperate with you to turn or whatever? Is it usually money? Is it ideology at all, or is it just because you're? No, it's very rarely ideology. So that's, uh-huh. that's 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 right. a rare day when you've uh-huh. got someone who you know, firmly that's that's like a Kim Philby, you know, sure. from the old days. Sure. Um, and so that 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 rarely happens. Usually, it's it's a more base reason. Sometimes it's a very you know sort of you know heart wrenching difficult reason they got a kid who otherwise can't get the medical attention you know the kid needs mm-hmm. uh there's some you know really underlying you know serious concern but um, a lot of times it's a very base thing they're pissed off at their superiors they don't feel like they got enough hugs they feel disrespected they want to show the world that they're smarter than everybody else sometimes it's straight up money you know which is which is a problem all by itself and uh, you know that's the why is that a problem? Well, I mean, because that's a, that's a tenuous connection sometimes. If all they're doing uh-huh. it for is the money, you don't have a, a, you know, you haven't really sunk the hook in them. You know, it's like uh-huh. it's like trying to bring in a, a, a really nice rainbow trout. and You kind of got the hook in there, but you're not. And you're just kind of <laughs> constantly worried about it. it's going to get off the line. Um, so, or do something stupid. <laughs> so, yeah, you, but you, but, you know, to, to the point we were talking about earlier in terms of being able to assess that and, and develop that and understand a person. Right, and be able to read right. motivations and find the weaknesses and the and the leverage points and what button you got to push to to turn them. Um, that's that's a process, and it, it's you know experience is what helps that. Yeah, and what makes somebody good at that. What are some of the things that you notice? Like, I, I definitely will mess around with ego down and try to like see how willing they are to to push back and go, no, 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 you got that wrong. And I, even to the point where I coach my interpreters, like I'm going to say things that you know are wrong. I need you to interpret those. And I'll, I'll say, you know, something like Ramadan's just like Christmas. And my interpreter will go, you know that that's not it. And I'm like, I'm asking a question. But you're trying to accomplish certain things. So ego down worked for me a lot. Also, like I, I would test their what I call their Marty McFly factor where I'm like, yeah, you're a chicken. And then they're like, I'm no chicken. And like the more that I could get those triggers, the more I knew I had the ability to work with those tools. Did you have things that were go-tos for you? Yeah, I mean, if, if, I would always check their socks first. Um, <laughs> see what, you know, what color they were wearing. But after that, then I would, no, I, you, you're, every, every, every uh, character is different, right? And yeah. So, and part of it is, you know, how much ability, you know, the, again, that's sort of a difference between um, kind of your world and, and, and the world where the outfit operates is sometimes, you know, our guys have more time to do the assessment ahead of time, right? So they can spend more time on a target getting that, that information in the back pocket before they ever even make initial contact. And, you know, you guys don't have the, that luxury a lot of times, but, you know, so I, you, you're always looking for, again, you're always looking to, to, uh, and every contact provides additional assessment data that you can use to try to, you know, refine and, and better understand, you know, the the, uh, the the character and the motivations, and you know, how to uh, again how to how to make it work for you. It's you know it, 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 to some degree, right? I mean, if you think about it, it's the same thing when when somebody you know some somebody male or female happens on both sides walks into a bar and you know, starts doing that, you know, that scan the room, starts doing an assessment, maybe, you know, starts talking to somebody that they're, they're doing some of these same things, right? The stakes aren't as high. Well, they might argue they are <laughs> in a very base, immediate sort of sense. Yeah, it's the same process to some degree, you know, that, that, that doesn't change. And, and again, I would argue the more you do it, the better you get at it. And there's certain parts about a person's personality that also have to be in there to make them good at it. You have to be willing to do that. You have to have an ability to kind of separate the, the mercenary nature of it from your everyday life uh, and not sit around moralizing about it. The morals of the whole thing. Like you've got to be willing to – the morality in our situation is completely different than it is like today right now. And, you know, the things that would be acceptable for me to do are um, – and, and, and expected – that were good things are completely different when you're home trying to sit on the floor and raise your daughter or, or trying to figure out if you've hooked that trout in that that, stream. Can you be more specific there though, Pete, because that's, that sounds just so nebulous. So it's sure I'll, I'll I'll be, I'll be visceral. I'll be graphic. When you go into a house where you think there's someone, and then you guys can explain to me the meaning of nebulous. That's a, I didn't know you guys were going to use big (laughs) words on this damn show. Jim's an author. I've got to try to show off some vocabulary. (laughs) (laughs) 
when you go into a targeted house and keep in mind like if i'm part of the collection it's it's my best guess and and i had to learn to really tighten up what my best guess was because someone's life was literally on the line not just our guys but but their guys too and so there's there's these lasting impacts that you just don't have time or the ability to measure so you've really got to do your homework and be confident with what you're doing before you go into someone's house so we go into someone's house and until someone calls the all clear, everything in there is treated like it's a threat. Now, maybe you see a kid and you're like, that kid's not a threat. You know, these women aren't a threat, but you're not sure until all clear is sounded. And if there's someone on the ground moving around and they're a threat, they get shot in the head. So that's like, that's crystal clear with things that are ethical. This is a person that you can render aid to in five minutes, but right now, in these minutes, that person gets shot in the head and there, and there is no aid after that. So when you're talking about that distinction of morality, it can be that fast where like, okay, now that everybody's cleared and the threat is over, now we can render aid to these people that we just busted into their house and shot them. That's the distinction. No, oh, no, I I just mulling that over, and so I was actually what I was actually doing was looking up the word nebulous, but but that's neither here nor there. Um, so I didn't hear I didn't hear a word Pete said, but uh, yeah, yeah, no, I you know I'm, um, I'm moralizing morals, uh, the ethics of it all. Um, you know, nobody accused me of being a deep thinker, so uh, you know, I I I maybe that's why I I had a good run at the outfit is, you know, I wasn't one of those people to sit around and ponder. <clears throat> My assumption was the seventh floor was telling me to do something or telling, you know, us to do something. They saw the big picture. I had a job to do. If I didn't like it, then I could damn well leave and go do something else in life. But I wasn't going to sit around and bitch and moan about it from inside. Like, you know, some folks do at, at, at other organizations, but, uh, I, you know, I never really thought about it in that sense in terms I didn't, I, I knew guys that did in, you know, in the operations group that would sit and get a little bit angsty about things. And, and, uh, that just, that wasn't me. So I'm not particularly well suited, I guess, to talk about it. Cause I, I, I saw things pretty clearly. How, how big a transition was it to, to go from narcotics, uh, to terrorism? I mean, that seems, uh, at least on paper, it seems like that's a huge jump. Was it? Uh, no, not really. Because you think about it, it's you know you got you got targets and you you know got uh, priority tasking and you know you've got to go whether they're you know engaged in you know cartel activity in one part of the the world or you know out in Asia or wherever it may be, or it's a, a, a terrorist organization or a support cell for a terrorist organization. You're you're, st- you're still talking about kind of the methodology. Uh, is the same, you know, you've got to prioritize, find the task or find the targets and, and, uh, come up with a solution. But I think it was not, it was not, I guess to answer your question uh, in a rambling way, it, it didn't seem like it was a, a leap. I don't think anybody I knew thought, Oh, geez, what are we doing in counter narcotics operations? That seems weird. Right. I mean, and we worked very well with DEA overseas. And, uh, again, you know, with the understanding that we approach things differently and right? our sources were always long term and, you know, there was a tendency in law enforcement to, you know, have a little less concern over the length, uh, of the shelf life of a, of a source because you're, you're after, you know, a particular end or conviction or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. So, but no, I didn't, I didn't see a big, a, a big leap there going from counterterrorism or counter narcotics to counterterrorism. Well, Pete, you have to talk about, uh, you know, your switch from drugs to blowing shit up. So, <laughs> Well, you know, the thing for me when we did it, it was it was counter narco in Afghanistan. And there was a lot of poppy where I was at. But the thing that I figured out was, is that our ability to stop the, the narcotics was really limited because we didn't it was the area was not permissive at all. It was just entirely too dangerous for a unit to move. If you were more than a mile and a half off the camp, there was no help coming. So you had to be able to, by the time it got there, there would not be any need for help if you were in a bad situation. So our ability to really deal with it was was muted tactically. And so honestly, it was barely a thing that we talked about. And, you know, and then the government systems to 
counter the narcotic completely failed. That was the biggest lesson was you have a governor that's trying to govern and we're out of his way and letting him govern. And he's like, let me take a crack at this, this narcotic thing. And he says, all right, farmers, you know, the government's going to give you this money. Let's all approve that we're all going to agree to not grow poppy this year. And then I'm going to get you the government subsidy that you're supposed to get for not growing the narcotics. And so they all thumb off. They all agree. And thumbing is, is how they all like sign their signature. And then come the harvest time, that's a big, huge harvest, and there's no money from the government. And so the farmers are like, yeah, we were willing to give this a shot of sorts, but also, you know, we have to stay alive. So for us, it wasn't something we could affect. And uh, and I was more focused on the affect at that point. Like, what, what are these guys willing to do and able to do? And the, nothing in the system rewarded any kind of good behavior from anybody, not the government, not the army, and not the farmers on the ground. So, I, you know, for me, it was, it was a tactical decision to focus my efforts on other parts where we could actually have some impact because focusing on the uh, poppy stuff just wasn't going to do yeah. anybody any good. And I think that's that's fairly consistent all the way around, no matter what agency you're talking about. Because there's, there are a few things, there are a few uh, taskings over the years that have been as as uh, frustrating and and you know producing as few results as the war on drugs. So and then and that again, that's whether you're talking about down south and you know Mexico, Mexico or Latin America or over in Asia or wherever it may be, the Golden Triangle. It's just it's you know it's it's a it's a tough game and. Um, so I, I, I think it was that was probably of all the activities between counterinsurgency and counter narcotics and counter terrorism. I think the counter narcotics was always the most frustrating. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. We 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 just tore up a bunch of hectares of poppy. I'm like, yeah, great. Uh, this guy still doesn't think his yeah, government does yeah. anything for him. So no, you could you could take you could take you could take an enormous amount. Um, off the uh, off the street, or, or and, and it would have no impact, right. right, on the on the pricing, and because it would just show you how much is, is is out there and how much is stockpiled. But but yeah, hey, you know what? I hate to do this, no, you um, but uh, yeah, I've got to I've got to jump there. Getting ready to board this next flight, so I, I've I've got to uh, I got to run. But and I apologize for that. But uh, I've got a lot of things here to think about. I gotta I gotta figure out the definition of several words. I've gotta come up with this idea about you wearing top side as blazers. I got I, I got. I got a lot on my list now. And check sock color. I mean, yeah. that's always important. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks a lot, Mike. We hope you can come back on and do some more with us. It was fun. I would do it. Yeah, thank you very much. Great to, great to talk to you guys. Thank you. Good talking, Mike.